All right, so this morning, again, we have a guest speaker in our Environmental Fridays series. Our guest speaker today is from around here, uh, Sarat Nature Center. He is the executive director, Nate Fuller. And he's worked at Sarat uh, as a naturalist from 1995 to 2001, and then came back as a director in 2019. He received his bachelor's degree in biology from Northland College in Ashland, Wisconsin. And he has a master's degree in geography with an emphasis in environmental and resource analysis from Western Michigan University. So I got to start talking with Nate over the summer and he's really excited to uh, work together with us and it's a, a pleasure to have you here to give us a lecture this morning on groundwater and the environment. Well, thank you for having me. Um, wish I could be there in person, of course. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more fun if we can do questions and answers as we go and get everyone engaged. But okay, we'll, we'll just do what we can as long as we can. If someone's got a real burning question, I don't mind being interrupted. Um, but happy to take questions at the end too. Okay. Uh, along there. So um, yes, I wanted to talk to you today about um, the water we don't see so much and how it's a major player in our environment. Um, and in particular, our role in the quality of our natural areas, but also the locations and quality of our natural areas. So I like to start with the first question is, um, do folks know where your water comes from? Um, a lot of people, you know, um, you would, you just, you turn on the sink and water comes out um, and you don't really think about where does that water come from? Well, it comes from the pipes. Well, how did it get into the pipes? You know, is your water coming from a nearby lake? Is it coming from a reservoir? Is it coming from the Great Lakes? Where? Do you know where your water is coming from and how it's getting there? And I can tell you in Berrien Springs, your water is being pumped out of deep wells. Um, a number of people I've talked to would think that, think that it's being piped in from like Lake Chapin or maybe all the way from Lake Michigan. But no, your, your water um, right there on campus, you've got pumps that are pulling water out from deep wells underground that gets stored up in the water towers and then gets distributed on demand. And so understanding where our groundwater comes from is important not only for our environment, natural communities, but for human resources. This is where a lot of uh, water quality issues have gotten in the news lately with PFAS um, and other groundwater contamination that people are very concerned about. Um, I will be, you'll be happy to know that when I just did some Google searching online, you could find the water reports for Berrien Springs and you guys are doing okay. But how does the water get underground? Um, again, it's not something that I had thought about a lot um, until I started working in um, habitat management situations. And I saw a um, wonderful presentation from professors out of MSU who came and met with the Mitchell Sater recovery team. And I'm gonna talk about Mitchell Saters a little bit later. They're a federally endangered butterfly. But we were trying to understand why the butterfly was restricted to certain habitats. And um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, worked with Dr. Lee and his student, Dr. Abbas, who now is a doctor and has mo moved on from MSU to try and understand where was the water coming from that supported the habitat that supported the rare animals? And so the, this, these diagrams are coming largely from um, Dr. Abbas's uh, work under Dr. Lee. And he was explaining to us that what happens is it starts with rain and the rain comes down and is going to land on the most permeable porous material and go through the ground. And that makes sense. So sand and gravel water can go through that type of soil much easier than clay or tight silt or such things. And so 
you get water going in through the most permeable soils down into the ground. And some of that is very localized. It doesn't go very far, but some of it is, goes very deep. And so you can have local recharge zones and deep recharge zones. The local ones, as it, you would make, expect from the name, it rains, it goes through, and it comes out fairly locally. The deep regional recharge zones can go down quite far, um, very deep, and take years to be expressed as spring water. So we've got our recharge zones um, and our, that are relatively short. Um, so it rains, the water goes down, it doesn't go particularly deep, um, and it's being expressed as spring water. And that can just take a matter of days to weeks for it to turn from rainwater, go through the gravel and sand, and then be expressed as spring water out by the headwaters of our local rivers and streams. The deep regional systems can actually take decades. This is when the rainwater is going down, actually all the way down to like the bedrock area and slowly creeping across the landscape and this can go across tens of kilometers, miles, till it comes back up to the surface and is expressed as springs. Now, some of these spring-fed wetland systems we're finding have both sources. They have both the deep regional source as well as the local source. And that's really important when um, we're talking about what's going to sustain these wetlands and keep them wet. So that even during a drought where the local discharge and recharge are drying up, we have these deep regional resources that the water is going to keep coming in because that's being, that was rain from sometimes 50, 60, 80 years ago um, is just now coming to the surface. And you have decades of pressure of water behind it, pushing it up to be expressed as a spring. So now this is a view of Berrien County um, with the relief slightly exaggerated here to give you the texture of the landscape. And you can see the texture of the landscape is and the surface water are really well um, matched. You can see how the rivers and streams and creeks are winding their way through the wrinkles on the landscape on there, working their way out to Lake Michigan. Now, what's surface water is relatively easy to understand in the sense of, you know, water flows downhill and it's going to work its way, the easiest path through all the wrinkles on the landscape, the glacial material, the gravel and sand mounds, it's going to wind its way out to Lake Michigan. What's the groundwater doing though? Does it follow those same rules? So here I zoomed out a little bit and I wanted to highlight two areas. My nature center over here closer to the lake, which is along the Paw Paw River. And then down here, Andrews University, where you guys are on the St. Joseph River down here. Now, the groundwater um, is still flowing towards Lake Michigan. It's still going down to the lowest point. Water does flow downhill. You can count on that. Um, but it's not necessarily following those surface channels. And where is it in our region that we are getting most of the water getting underground? And I wanted to zoom out to highlight some of this texture because the wrinkliest spots you'll see on this map, those are the mounds of large mounds of gravel and sand. So to the east of you over here, this big wrinkle ridge here is the Kalamazoo Moraine. So if you were to drive east from Bering Springs towards Dowajak, um, you would come against this large ridge. And in between Andrews and that ridge is the big outflow area. So this Kalamazoo Moraine is an area where a lot of rainwater is able to make it down through these giant mounds of gravel and sand into groundwater. This was left over as the glaciers melted. Um, they left behind these large piles of gravel and sand called moraines. A little closer to home, right here, this wrinkly bit that goes through um, the uh, Berrien County, that's largely the Valparaiso Moraine. And 
these moraines dictated where the surface water flows. Now, the St. Joseph River starts far to the east near Jackson, Michigan. Now, if it had a, the easiest path, if there weren't any glacial moraines, you would see it cutting straight across and dumping, you could draw a line between St. Joseph and Jackson, but that's not what the St. Joe River does. It dips far down south into Indiana and where there, it has a big south bend in the river before it curls back north to come back through right by your university out into St. Joseph. That south bend, which is what the city is named for, is because the river was forced south due to the Kalamazoo and Valparaiso moraines. So it didn't have a straight shot because of these mounds of gravel. Um, and so that's why we have this um, unusual course, not a straight line of the river. Now that's the surface water. The groundwater, meanwhile, the rain is falling down into these gravel moraines and piling up and now sheeting um, towards the Great Lakes, towards Lake Michigan. Now, <clears throat> with that idea that we've got, I'll back up here just a second, that we've got water flowing in two different ways in our state, in our region, is that we've got the surface water, which has, has to navigate around surface water obstacles, but that we also have groundwater systems that are having to navigate underground uh, barriers and is flowing towards Lake Michigan. And what that means is that water is being expressed in different areas and where that water comes out and the way it comes out dictates what kind of plants, what type of natural communities, where animals live on our landscape. So one of the groups I work with the most is Michigan Natural Features Inventory. They're part of a national program called the National Heritage Database. Every state has its own natural heritage database. In Michigan, ours happens to be called Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Down in Indiana, it might be called the Indiana Natural Areas Commission, um, but they all share a database where they keep track of rare plants and animals in natural communities. And actually, if I pause here and I can just skip right over to my website. Can you see my uh, the website I have up there? Um, yes. Okay. So um, the Michigan Natural Features Inventory actually used to be housed by the Michigan DNR, but politics got involved and they got uh, moved over to MSU's extension service. But if you go to Michigan Natural Features Inventory, you can look up anything you want about the natural communities. There are actually 70 different types of natural communities that they recognize throughout the state that are dictated by what kind of plants grow there, what kind of animals can be found there, and where they are found in the landscape. So in particular, I'm interested today talking about the different wetland groups called the Palustrian ones. In particular, I'll be talking about the bog and the fen ones, but you know, you can look into, you know, if you're a lumper or a splitter, you know, you can lump them all into the fens, or you can, depending on where they are in the landscape and what kind of specialty plants are growing there, you can break them up into five different kinds over there. I recommend uh, visiting this website. You can learn a lot about all of Michigan's rare animals as well um, as the plants. You can scroll through, and if you want to know about, for example, the, um, I'll be talking about the uh, Neonympha michelii michelii. Where'd he go? Neonympha. There he is, the Mitchell Seder. You want to know more about the Mitchell Seder? You can go there and it'll talk about all about it there. Let me go back to my presentation. Okay. So, now let me turn back the clock a little bit and talk about the distribution of natural communities. Because historically, before the intensive settlement of Europeans, um, there was the indigenous people living in Michigan who 
their experience was very different than current day, where Michigan, Northern Indiana, the whole Great Lakes region was a mosaic of all different types of natural communities that were spread out. And why, why were those different natural communities where they were? Um, that was driven largely by where, what type of soils were present and what type of water was available. Now this information I have here, the land cover type from 1800, what that is, is the first surveyors um, um, representing the you know, fledgling United States came out and walked every section line of Michigan, as well as Ohio and Indiana, and took notes on what kind, what the landscape looked like. They were measuring plots for settlers to come and um, trying to anticipate where the best place to start a settlement, a farm would be. Um, and so from those notes, we can get a snapshot of what the landscape looked like in 1800. And this is available, you can look at it for the entire state. If you're interested in that, I, I'm fascinated by personally about how natural communities have changed and evolved over time and what used to be there and what still remains. So when we're looking at this splash of color out here, um, what I'm really looking at trying to understand is what was historically there and how have things changed? Um, and I'll come back to that again in a minute here. So if we're looking at Berrien County, you can see that a huge swath of Berrien County, this dark green was beech sugar maple forest. That meant that there was richer soils with plenty of water available but you get up closer to the St. Joseph area. And this was more of an oak base, this oak hickory forest here. But right down here, you see this bright yellow spot. Um, that's kind of an intriguing little spot right there. It seems very out of place. That was a prairie. That is wolf prairie. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the very few prairies, if I go back here, in Berrien County. There was a couple down here in Bertrand Township down on the Indiana line and prairies get more common. Um, you can see down here along down towards Indiana with the grassland and scattered and that's representing the drier gravelly soils. But here right uh, along the St. Joseph River was a prairie. And that is because the indigenous peoples were managing the landscape with fire. It was predisposed, it would have been higher, drier, gravelly and sandy, but repeated fire would have kept that as a prairie. And that is modern day Berrien Springs. And we see this pattern repeated throughout the Midwest of where there were open grasslands, that's where people put up settlements, especially if there was grasslands next to a river. The settlers recognized that you didn't have to clear trees to start farming. This was a perfect place to claim as their own to displace the native peoples and start farming. You had access to water and then you also had access to be farming. And so the first towns and cities of the Midwest were usually these little prairie outpoints. So I find that fascinating in Berrien Springs. You can see the footprint of Berrien Springs almost ties completely right to Wolf Prairie. And I do wanna point out, and I'll come back to it across the river was a um, rich tamarack swamp that was a spring fed wetland system out here. And what's intriguing to me is while the prairies got turned into houses, um, a lot of these wetland communities remain. And this is called Indian Bowl over here. And it's an intriguing place because that natural community is still largely intact even after hundreds to thousands of years. So when we're looking at this distribution of the landscape of the natural communities, and we overlay the topography, you can see the ridges, those piles of sand and gravel, creating these drier oak-based natural communities, while the less wrinkly spots, except right around here in the, where it's um, rich along the river here, you'll get more beech maple forest, but that's also because of the rain shadow from Lake Michigan. Well, let's go, get back to the groundwater part because as I mentioned before, it all starts as rainwater. We witnessed some of the surface water flowing off down to the low areas, but now we've got this rainwater that's getting down deep and flowing underground and being expressed as springs in these areas. But the journey that water takes 
along its way to be expressed as springs really matters because the different type of rock and minerals it's passing through changes the chemistry of the water. So not all springs and not all wetlands are the same because of that journey the water has taken. Now, a quick reminder for those who, who haven't thought about pH, the acidity of things in a while. There is a <coughs> pH scale um, from zero to 14. Seven is neutral. That's where we uh, uh, talk about water. You can have acids where the numbers get lower. You get the extreme of like battery acid and stomach acid that dissolve things. But then, you know, your morning um, tea or coffee um, or uh, sports drink might have a acidity of closer to five, tomato juice, lemon vinegar. You can see you can start to dissolve things um, almost with vinegar down here. But then we also have basic or alkaline areas. That's where you get the Tums uh, come in to for reduce the acidity in your stomach. All right, I just wanted to give you, we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we go forward because our wetlands have different pH levels, different levels of acidity or alkalinity based on the water that's coming up from underground. So a bog, um, a bog is a natural community where there is no spring water. It imagine almost like a swimming pool, you know, a big uh, basin out in the natural area that's filled with uh, sphagnum moss and that Sphagnum moss gradually floats and fills in, and that sphagnum moss creates it extremely acidic. So a bog is an acidic wetland, where again, the pH, you can see it's down three or four, so it's almost like vinegar to coffee, you know, um, the acidity of a soft drink out there. It's a very challenging place for plants to live. Um, that's where you get carnivorous plants, like pitcher plants and sundews because the chemistry is so difficult for plants to do their regular photosynthesis that they have to supplement with other nutrient sources where they'll actually catch and trap um, insects and other critters to um, break down and provide surplus nutrients. On the other end of that pH scale, the alkaline areas is where we have fens. And fens are spring-fed communities where the water is flowing underground, it goes through limestone. And that water dissolves the limestone along the way, which drops the, where, which raises the pH up between eight and nine at times. So we're talking the pH of blood and baking soda. Remember that's down here. Um, and again, an extreme condition where plants are living on the edge because it's so difficult to do their regular metabolism or whatever you want to call it, photosynthesizing uh, because the pH is so high. Uh, the water chemistry has changed. Most of our wetlands are closer to neutral, the term marsh where you see cattails and such. And so the thing to remember now, bogs are the ponded water areas where the acid can build up. Marsh is where water is flowing through and isn't particularly being driven by the minerals that it's gone through, often surface water. And then fens are those spring-fed systems where it's been dissolving limestone and making it extremely alkaline. And that means that fens um, are actually turning out to be one of the most biologically diverse natural communities we have in Michigan. Because not only can some of the marsh plant species live out here, but now you've got what we call the calcifiles the extreme plants that can live in alkaline conditions. And the calcifile refers to the fact that as the limestone gets dissolved, comes out as spring, it comes out as, this, uh, as um, it gets exposed to air temperature and then it comes back out of the dissolved and precipitates um, to create these calcareous or calcium rich um, wetlands out here. We can see in this picture how gray the soil is. That's actually marl. That's where the dissolved limestone has come out and precipitated out to create the specialized soil type for this wetland. 
Now back to what some of Dr. Lee and Dr. Abbas were looking at was they were trying to understand where are these fens uh, getting their groundwater? What is it associated with? And they did modeling across the Southern Lower Peninsula. So down here in the corner here is Berrien County, um, this big uh, 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 high point over here is Hillsdale County. You've got Detroit over here on the east side. And what they found is that these are largely the moraine systems. We have the Kalamazoo moraine, Valparaiso moraine over here. There's a huge moraine system that runs from Hillsdale up through Ann Arbor area here that if they looked at these high ridges, um, these were large deep groundwater mounds. These were the sources when I pointed out that deep water, not the shallow water, this is the source of where groundwater is going deep all the way down to the bedrock area where when it rains on the Van Buren mound, it might take 70 years for that water to be expressed out as a spring along the St. Joseph River. And then they mapped out the location of our prairie fence. These are the spring fed alkaline wetlands um, and found that yes, they were closely aligned to where these groundwater mounds were. The black dots are um, regular prairie fens. The red dots are where there's endangered species associated with these fens. And they also started looking in more detail about some of these specific sites. This was being funded looking for the Mitchell Sater butterfly, trying to understand their ecology. And what you see here, this out point here is Surret Nature Center along the Paw Paw River. And this is the Van Buren Mound over here. And they looked at the cross section between those points, looked at the topography, but then they looked at the underlying surface geology. And they did that by mapping out all of the recorded wells throughout the region. Every time someone puts in a well, that record of what type of soil got dug through gets put submitted to the state. So they looked at the well records throughout that area and then could map the underlying geology across there. And then they did some analysis and could show that the spring water we're seeing out here at Surret started miles away at this high point, came down and this gray area is clay. So it actually was going to potentially come up to the surface. You can see some of these local recharge areas, but it got forced down deep under this clay mound to then be expressed as springs at here at Surret Nature Center. And when I look at that, on the surface, you can see it's actually near the Keeler State Game Area is where the spring water from Surrette is coming from. It's, um, that significant portion of the water that supports our springs started um, nearly nine miles away. And why is that important? Because a lot of these rare plants and animals depend on that spring water for survival. Um, the two poster children for fen habitat are the Mitchell Sater butterfly and the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake because um, they are both federally listed. Um, the rattlesnake um, was most recently, just um, in the last two years, shifted to federally threatened and the Mitchell Sater has, federally, has been federally endangered for um, close to 30 years. Now, a, a quick digression, what does that mean to be federally threatened or federally endangered? Um, there's, they actually mean specific things. People tend to use them um, interchangeably, but really they have very specific meanings. And so that natural heritage database I mentioned, the information that all the states are sharing, they um, keep track of what um, animals are doing on the national or federal level and on the state level. So endangered means that a species is, is in danger of extinction of actually being fully eliminated. Now state endangered means it's in danger of extinction from the state. So for example, the marbled salamander. There's only about two locations in Michigan where the marbled salamander still exists. However, if you go farther south, marbled salamanders become increasingly common. So by the time you're down in the Smoky Mountains, they're a relatively common species. So they have no federal status. They're not in danger of extinction across the country, just in Michigan. 
However, a Carner blue butterfly down here, they are state threatened in Michigan, but federally endangered. So the Carner blue butterfly is in danger of going extinct from the country, but Michigan's population is actually one of the best in the country, and they're only considered threatened in Michigan. So you can see it's that concept of threatened indicates that a species is likely to become endangered. So it's the step before endangered. Endangered means you're about to become extinct. Threatened means you're in danger of becoming endangered. So your risk, it's the risk level. So again, a couple other examples, the cerulean warbler is state threatened in Michigan. We're on the edge of its range. So it's still doing okay across the nation and it's doing, it, we're not worried about them going extinct from Michigan just yet, but their populations are not doing well and we're worried about them becoming endangered. Copper belly water snakes, snakes. In Michigan, they are on the brink of disappearing. Pretty much they're only found in Hillsdale County anymore in Michigan. But um, across the nation, they're in bad shape, but they aren't on the brink of extinction. Okay, I just had to do a quick uh, digression on that because people often mix up what we're talking about when we say threatened and endangered. So going back to um, our local uh, threatened and endangered species, what do these very different animals have in common? Well, they both are most common in fens. Mitchell satyrs are only found in fens in these spring fed wetlands. And the rattlesnakes are only found in spring fed wetlands, which includes fens and rich tamarack swamps and a handful of others. Um, and if you go farther north, they're using different habitats, but right, I'm gonna focus here, right here in Southern Michigan. These are both tied to these spring fed wetlands. And we're trying to understand why, what is it? It's not their food source. Mitchell satyrs um, as caterpillars eat a relatively common collection of grasses and sedges. Rattlesnakes can eat any sort of rodents. We're not in short supply of rodents. It seems to be it's their overwintering. There's something about the way the groundwater um, operates in winter that keeps them from dying because the Mitchell satyr survives the wetland as a caterpillar down right near the soil, right where the water is coming out, where the humidity stays high and it doesn't freeze solid. And the rattlesnakes go into burrows um, sometimes crayfish holes and other times other animal burrows right next to the groundwater level. And that keeps them from freezing. So it really seems to point to the fact that these spring fed wetlands are critical for the survival because we think the pinch point in the life cycle of these animals is the fact that they don't freeze in the wet over winter. So that means we need to understand how the groundwater is flowing. And if we're going to protect these habitats, where is that groundwater coming from? So to that, we're working on um, um, active projects right now, trying to understand these things. The US Geological Service has joined with the Fish and Wildlife Service to start doing tests throughout the region. And one of the areas we're looking at is at Surrett Nature Center. They've been out in the last month. They were doing soil borings where they shove the soil core down into the wetland and can pull it out and get examples. And we're looking at different layers of peat, of marl and sand and trying to better understand how is the water flowing under the, through the soils of these wetlands, um, both on a shallow and a deep level. They just installed six long-term uh, ground watering wells, which they're gonna be putting in monitoring systems to track the pH, the water doing other water chemistry because we wanna know more about um, are there pollutants coming in through the groundwater that we don't know about? You know, are there nutrient loading? Because these are traditionally nutrient poor systems and they start to break down if nutrients get added. So for example, um, runoff from agricultural fields or contaminated groundwater where um, phosphorus is getting into the system and threatens um, to break down the whole community and all the animals and plants that survive on it. We're also looking at um, the local climate. So we're working with Kalamazoo Nature Center and the Fish and Wildlife Service to set out climate monitors where we're tracking um, uh, the humidity and temperature and similar metrics at about six inches off the ground and about three feet off the ground. 
um, and documenting that data. Because the goal is that we can better understand how these communities work. And so if we're going to restore them or introduce, try to introduce these rare animals, do captive rearing into other areas, we need to understand how these systems work um, and so that we're putting them in an opportunity for success. And it's been important for us here at the Nature Center to start to map out and understand where our communities are. So we knew about these two prairie fens because the Mitchell satyrs occur there, but the rattlesnakes are showing up in other places out there. And we've just now started trying to map out, and this is our first draft, we need to fine tune it. But in a sense, we have rich tamarack swamp much more extensively through Surrett than we thought. And a rich tamarack swamp is another um, alkaline spring-fed system. Um, it doesn't seem to be able to support Mitchell satyrs, but it does support Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes. And I will pause just about here, but I want to point out that right across the river from you over there is county property, a county park um, called Indian Bowl. And uh, that is a rich tamarack swamp that I know at least historically had um, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes in it. And I know there's someone in your de biology department who's been looking carefully at um, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes. And they've been working with the county and the county has been looking at how can they look after Indian Bowl because it's um, this wetland, there's a, the ridge of the floodplain is very steep here and there's groundwater flowing out at the base creating springs that feed. You can actually see the wrinkling springs in here into the St. Joe River and that is its own special natural community being fed by groundwater and it has that special alkaline component. Not quite as alkaline, I believe, as a prairie fen, but I could be mistaken because some of the plants that show up there suggest there could be pockets of fen mixed into that tamarack swamp. Well, I see we've hit 835 or so, so I'd be happy to take questions at this point. Okay. Um, do you guys have questions? I've got several questions here, but let me begin with, um, so what are some of the, the, the threats, the threats uh, to the wetlands in our area? So they're being, um, they have challenges from a number of different directions. There's historically wetlands got um, dredged and drained because people saw them as a nuisance, unproductive land, a source of disease, mosquitoes, um, and rich soil that would be better served for farming. So they tried to dewater them. So we lost a lot. In some areas of our state, we lost 75 to 90% of our wetlands due to conversion um, to for, largely for agriculture. Uh, it's even more dramatic when you go over a state line into Northern Indiana. So that's historically what went wrong for them. Um, okay. In more modern days, we have um, issues of invasive species and uh, alteration of groundwater. So, and often those go hand in hand. Invasive species are often symptoms of disturbance. So we see invasive Phragmites grass or glossy buckthorn. Um, it's usually because there's been surplus nutrients dumped into the system. Um, Phragmites follow salt often from roadways, which is a contamination um, and, and similar such things. But then we're also seeing unprecedented water withdrawal um, due to our spread of human development and agriculture. Um, both of them, you tend to get camps of some people trying to blame ag and some people trying to blame development, but really it's a wholesale problem that needs to be discussed um, honestly on both sides because um, a lot of those well systems are interrupting that groundwater flow. Okay, so Sean has a question sort of a follow-up then. What is done to help repopulate wetlands that had large populations of invasive species that were removed? So um, one of the, um, so wetlands have an advantage um, for restoration in that the seeds of the native vegetation live, um, can survive um, 
a long, long time in wetlands. Um, it's the lack of oxygen means that their seeds can survive um, decades to actually, some <clears throat> studies are showing over a hundred years. So, and sometimes all we need to do is um, identify why the invasive species are thriving, address that. So is it because of ditching? Is it because of other inputs? And then remove the invasive species and the native vegetation will come back on its own because of, we call that a seed bank. In some cases, the alteration has been too severe and they need to be sown back in. And people, there's actually native plant nurseries that will work on providing sources that way. Okay. Uh, Jonathan has a question. Can you give some examples of plants that grow particularly well in calcareous soil? Yes. So um, one of my favorites is called grass of Parnassus, which actually isn't a grass at all. It's a beautiful cream colored flower um, on a single stalk out there. Um, one of the indicator species we look for is called shrubby syncofoil, Potentilla fruticosa. It's a very, it's about a knee high shrub that gets covered in bright yellow flowers. So when I'm scouting an area looking for its potential for fen, I key in on first thing I'm looking for is, it depends on the time of year, but that shrubby syncofoil is, is the flag that I go looking for. I also look for tamaracks as far as the tree species, um, more wildflowers. Um, there's a whole lot of specialized ones, calms, lobelia. Um, uh, um, interestingly, you'll get crossover between bogs and fens. It's these plants that are designed for living on the extremes. So you'll get pitcher plants and sundews, these carnivorous plants that live in both bogs and fens because their specialty is to live in the extreme. Mm. They can survive where most other plants would die from lack of nutrient availability because the chemistry is such that the plants can't effectively or efficiently photosynthesize. So when they're supplementing with other, with dead bugs, um, they can survive better. If you go into a wetland, like a fen, another thing I look for is the tall wetland wildflowers like Joe pie weed and bone set will get shorter and shorter and shorter as the alkalinity goes up higher and higher and higher. So you'll know you're in a fen when the Joe pie weed is only knee high um, as opposed to chin high when you were walking through a Southern wet meadow. Okay. Um, so I was looking up also some um, of the streams here in Berrien County. And one of them is the, um, the Lemon Creek, Lemon Creek. Mm -hmm. um, are many of these streams just um, springs? They, they, they start from springs or something? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So all of our waterways here in Southern Michigan are spring sourced. You go out west, you can have glacial melt and other things as the, the source. But here in Southern Michigan, everything starts as a spring. Okay, so these are underground sources that's being now expressed. Exactly. How far underground does uh, some of this water go? In terms um, of like feet or whatever, miles or I don't know. Yeah, so you know, it, it very much depends on the location, but it can go all the way down to bedrock. So it can be, you know, hundreds of feet um, okay. uh, down below. Uh, if you've got them under these, and that's where we're interested in these large gravel mounds, the moraines, mm -hmm. the glacial moraines, which are several hundred feet of, of glacial debris of the coarse sand and gravel. And that allows the water to go down very, very deep. Okay. How much of the, Ariana has a question. We'll probably take just one more. How much of the water, local water is actually from groundwater? So um, most drinking sources in our region in Southwest Michigan are groundwater sourced. Hmm. Um, uh, you, it's not until, so like Chicago gets their water from Lake Michigan. Um, and I'm not sure how many of the coastal cities are drawing from Lake Michigan because it's actually relatively expensive. You have to, you can't just throw a pipe in at the beach. They have to run the pipes in very, very far. So they're past the sunlit zone because you don't want to be sucking in the algae. 
Um, that's a whole other story of when zebra mussels came in and they cleared up the water of Michigan and now algae can get down deeper and Chicago had to run their pipes out um, much, much farther into the darkness because all of the um, water source for Chicago was starting to get contaminated with algal blooms. Um, Lake Erie um, surrounding residents run into this all the time. That's in the news a lot of the algal blooms uh, happening and they struggle with their drinking water there. But by and large, almost everyone, as soon as you come in with a couple miles from Lake Michigan, you're gonna be talking about groundwater as our drinking water source. Okay. All right, I know the students have to um, get ready to leave for their next class. Uh, we wanna thank you very much for your presentation. I, you and I could um, probably continue uh, for a bit because we are recording it. And so the students could um, look at uh, some of our continuing conversation, but we wanna thank you guys um, here. I know you guys have to take off. It's 8.46 now. Your next class is coming up here really soon. But I'll continue the conversation for a bit longer with um, Mr. Fuller. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I was looking online too when you were speaking and found that just in Berrien County, there are like 39 streams. Oh, yeah. That's what I found online. That I, and all of these are from groundwater the source is groundwater most of them it yeah. looks like yeah if i go back to this um where's my map here sorry i should have there we go this one mm -hmm. um yeah you can see every one of these little tiny um, little creeks and streams are starting as springs. Mm -hmm. So every, everything is spring fed in our area. Yeah, I was, I think a summer ago, trying to figure out, um, you know, the, diff the, the watershed area, uh, in our area. And so I went up to Lake uh, Bobbies, um, which is the head waters for um, St. Joe River. Mm. So that was fascinating. But then I started to think, well, what are the um, headwaters for like these streams? And I tried and tried <laughs> looking around, <laughs> but it was just like a marshland or something in some yes. cases, you know? Uh, so that's why I was kind of interested in knowing, um, for example, Lemon Creek. Um, and others. So, so I can point out a couple of things too. When you look at like this map here, mm -hmm. when you get up towards, um, this is, let's see, this is, this is Blue Creek mm -hmm. uh, along here and uh, farther up. Some of these, when they're coming out of the gravel moraine areas, mm -hmm. so when it's coming out of the sand and gravel, you can actually get pretty strong flow and very distinct spring sources out here, okay. out there. When it's relatively flat, when we're looking down here in um, like Lemon Creek type mm -hmm. area, um, you can see and actually the hard right angles of mm -hmm, these creeks mm -hmm, down here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those have, this is all agricultural area. Those have been ditched and altered. And typically what we're having in this region is, um, and especially off the edge of these moraines, is you had vast areas of moist wetlands, uh, that's redundant, I suppose, of these sort of um, uh, rich black soil wetlands mm -hmm. where the water is more oozing up um, as more of seeps rather than clear defined springs. Okay. And so the, the whole region would have been soggy, a giant mess, and wouldn't have um, consolidated into an active bed of a stream or a creek till much farther down. But um, this was all such rich, um, desirable farmland 
that they got straightened and ditched. And so that instead of a large, vast, wet, mucky area, mm -hmm. they found if they could carve channels through it, it pulled the water out of the wetlands and dried those areas out. And so now we see these very straight line ditched areas because that we say that dewatered this region, making it farmable. Okay. Yeah, I think also um, that one of these streams, I think it's the is Lemon Creek, basically has its mouth just behind um, um, Andrews um, into the into the St. Joe River. Okay. Um, down by the, the farm, I believe, somewhere in that area. And that was kind of interesting for me to try and go back and see. But okay, um, have we seen any effect of um, um, agricultural pollution on these wetlands in our area? Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, there's, there's going to be inputs um, and it's um, actually my, uh, my wife, that's a large part of what she's working on and she's okay. working in a partnership with Notre Dame. Okay. Um, trying to understand um, what are the agricultural inputs into our waterways. Because okay. um, it gets very contentious um, yeah. when you're, you're talking about farming and like, you know, they both of how much water does farming require as far as irrigation, but also um, what is flowing off of the fields and how much and are there, um, are there better um, ways to do farming that reduce runoff and reduce pollution. So they're looking at filter strips. Um, they're looking at um, the irrigation, um, the, um, the, um, the amount of water runoff, the um, uh, farm drains, the, I'm sorry, the, the uh, farm tiles they're referred to. Okay. Uh, have you heard of tiling before? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so the farm tiles, um, they get the name from historically, um, farmers would, when their fields were too wet, they would use clay, perforated clay pipes. So clay pipes about, you know, ranging from a few inches to several inches that would have holes in them and they would um, stick them together to create a, basically a, a drain, underground drainage to drain the soil better. Um, the perforated pipes would let water through and it would flow out more quickly. And they referred to those as tiles because they were clay. Nowadays, they're black corrugated plastic tubes uh -huh. um, that get laid down um, in the fields low and deep enough to um, allow the surface to be plowed and tilled, but um, they collect and uh, move the water off the field more quickly. And so um, one of the projects Aaron, um, my wife is looking at with uh, Notre Dame is what what is coming off in those drain tiles um are there because most drain tiles have been put in and they just are free open and flowing are there issues with um, um excess nutrients is there e coli um is there extra sediment going along and, and they're looking at those measurements and seeing can you actually shift the way drain tiles are used to improve that but that's really hurt her expertise, and I should stop talking about that because you you'll have her on in uh, January, I believe, and you can, yes yes can get, find out all that from her. Yeah. Okay. And last question, I think here, does the name Berrien Springs have anything to do with the amount of like groundwater in this area, or do you know? Oh, you know, I I don't know, but I expect it probably <laughs> did. Um, yeah. You know that that sort of you're a little on higher ground um, with a lot of the um, well-drained soils above. So I imagine there's springs all coming at the base again, like Indian Bowl. You mm. know, is is a well-known natural community amongst the um, ecologists in the region because of its um, unusual plant community and the, that stems from the rich spring, uh, the amount of springs at the site. Okay. All right, very good. So we will definitely be in touch, keep um, this conversation going. And it was really great to have you here and talk with our students. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, 
Uh, I hope right. we can do it again sometime. Okay, well, yeah, we'll talk offline too. All right, take care. Okay, take care. Have a great day. Okay. All right, bye-bye.